Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, when I checked our live streaming on our website right before we started, uh, we do have people here from uh, watching us from Australia, from Brisbane and Seven Hills, Australia. We have people from Tijuana, Mexico, uh, BC, uh, British Columbia, Canada. And of course, in the USA, we have people from New York, Michigan, California, Arkansas, Washington, Idaho, Colorado, Missouri, Texas, Florida, Iowa, Illinois, Oregon, Alabama, and New Mexico, and many others. So we just thank everybody for live streaming with us. One of the announcements that we want to make, we do have our Shava Oak Conference on CD available. There's eight CDs. Okay, there's eight CDs in here covering everything that Dr. Frank Seekins taught, Rabbi Lappin, and myself, uh, and it's $35. So that's pretty good for eight CDs. But it is available uh, from Nancy there in the back. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we can come together and learn of you and hear from your prophets, for truly they did not speak of their own will or of their own accord, but they spoke as they were moved upon by your Ruach HaKodesh. And Father, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what the prophets spoke. Uh, you know, when we think of uh, the time frame that uh, Jeremiah lived in and King Josiah, uh, there were prophets that were speaking your word, and uh, some of them... Uh, were not listened to, and some were. And so, Father, we just pray that we would have hearing ears, that we could hear from your prophets, even though they spoke thousands of years ago. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. All right. What we're looking at today is Jeremiah. And again, when I was here, uh, spoke the last time a few weeks ago, what we have been concentrating on, as we have mentioned, the book of Jeremiah is tangled up, mixed up as far as it's not in chronological order. And so what we've been looking at the first few weeks is chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 12, 15, 16, 17, and tonight we're going to move into chapter 11. Now, uh, go ahead and put the first uh, PowerPoint up here. Uh, what we're going to kind of recap again in another way tonight is the dates from 633 through 622 BC, if you have your chart there. And uh, if you'll notice, 633 BC, uh, at the bottom uh, left corner, Yehoahaz was born. Uh, we see the next year, it's the eighth year of Josiah. He's been king eight years, and he's only 16 years old. Uh, the next year, he has another son, Yehoiakim. And then you'll notice in 628 BC, uh, Josiah is now 20 years old. It's the 12th year of his reign. And this is when reforms begin, okay? He's beginning to make some changes uh, in what's been happening in the nation of Israel. And then that following year, uh, the 13th year of his reign, this is where Jeremiah begins prophesying. This is where we're at, looking at these chapters 1 and 2 and 12, 15, 16, 17. That's why uh, you have them on your chart here, you see on the screen. Uh, we see uh, at 627 BC, Nabal Palaser has now become king in Babylon. He's kind of broken away from Assyria. Uh, the next following year, uh, Babylon gets total independence from Assyria. And uh, Art uh, did a great job last week speaking on the book of Zephaniah, which is right during this time frame. And then we're going to, uh, we see in chap uh, chapter 11 in uh, 622 BC on the far right, Josiah is now 26 years old. Uh, this is the year, uh, the 18th year of his reign, that they find the Torah scroll. So uh, by 628 BC, King Josiah is 20 years old. He's already had two kids. It's the 12th year of his reign. And uh, he's a little more assured of himself. I mean, how assured of yourself can you be at eight years old? I mean, you're a second grader. Okay. And uh, as he gets a, a little bit older, he's 20 years old, he's a little more assured of himself. So now he begins reforms after hearing all the prophecies that are coming. I mean, he's listening to these other prophets that were before him. I mean, he's familiar with Isaiah and what he said and what he wrote. And so uh, what do we find? Uh, if you remember, there was a prophecy to Hezekiah that your whole nation is going to be taken into Babylon. And of course, Babylon hadn't even become a nation yet. But remember what the prophet said to Hezekiah? It isn't going to happen in your day, right? And what was Hezekiah's words? Wahoo. Okay, let it happen to the kids. 
And so anyway, so every generation after that is wondering, am I the generation that's going to be carried off into Babylon? Well, think about this. King Josiah, he's 20 years old. This next year, all of a sudden, he sees this nation of Babylon rising to power. What do you think is going to be in Josiah's mind? I'm the generation. It's me. You know, it wasn't dad. It wasn't grandpa. You know, it was great grandpa. And now all of a sudden, it's, it's I'm the one who is experiencing Babylon coming into being. I, I begin to wonder if, if it was my generation that this was going to be happening to. Okay, um, so uh, chapter 11, of course, is five years later, uh, the 18th year of his reign when he's 26 years old, and Jeremiah's 28. Uh, by then, it's the seventh year of Reformation, and they find the Torah scroll. But what I want to do tonight is I want to begin with the 13th year of Josiah's reign. Think about this. The reforms have begun. He's actually torn down idols and images and altars. And now here comes 23-year-old Jeremiah on the scene, who's just two years older than him. They're both pretty young. And Jeremiah's prophesying. And let's take a look at this next clip. What does it say in Jeremiah 2? God says, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And secondly, they've hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that don't even hold water. Now, last time when I was speaking on this, I spoke about these cisterns were representing really two different things. They were representing either their idols, which are empty and vain things, but we also saw when we read it that they also represented the Assyrians and the Egyptians who do not meet their expectations. They were always leaning upon foreign nations to help them. And how many of you know the foreign nations aren't real good at supporting Israel? So let's take a look at this next picture here. Can you imagine, I don't know how many of you have imagined a stone that's been engraved upon. If you're going to engrave a stone, do you need something with a pretty hard tip that's not going to break? This is a, a pin of iron and it has like a diamond on it. Now, a, there's anything harder than a diamond? Okay, a diamond is going to, but a pin of iron and a diamond you would need for a stone. Would you need a pin of iron and a diamond point for a piece of paper? Well, look at what we see here now. Imagine, this is Jeremiah's, one of his first prophetic words to Josiah and the nation of Israel. And this is after the reforms have begun, a year, a year later. He says, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart. So let's bring in this heart. What is God saying about Judah's heart? It's as hard as a rock. That's what he's saying. You, your heart is stone cold. You're hard hearted that the only way I'm going to get through to you is with an iron pen and a diamond point. He says, and on the horns of your altars, while their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills. You realize what this is saying? A year before Josiah had torn a lot of these things down and everyone's already missing them. He says, oh, my mountain in the field, I will give you as plunder your wealth, all your treasures and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, are going to let go of your heritage, which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you don't know, for you've kindled a fire in my anger, which will burn forever. Thus saith the Lord. Now, look what it says here. It says, thus saith the Lord, cursed is the man who does what? Curses is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. This is incredible. This is incredible. And then in Jeremiah 2.22, look at this. It says, for though you wash yourself with nitre. Now that word there means an acid. How do you know... Uh, Acid, if you get acid on you, you're, that's pretty bad. You would think it would get rid of anything, <laughs> okay? It says, and you take much soap. Well, what it says, much soap, that's an alkali. Okay, both extremes, an extreme acid or an extreme alkali, both of those are really serious business. And God is saying, you know what? 
Even if you took both of those things, your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. He says it's not going to work. You know why a strong alkaline, a strong acid isn't going to work? That word for mark there means engraved. In other words, the sin is engraved on their stony heart. And an alkaline and acid isn't going to get rid of an engraved stone marking. So what do we find here? Let's look at this next uh, clip here. But what does it say? It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, which spread out its roots by the river, will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. Bring in some fruit here. You know, when, think about this. We're reading Jeremiah. Where does that verse ring a bell to everybody? In Psalms. John 15, 8, before we go to Psalms, let's look at John 15, 8. How was the Father glorified? The Lord says that you bear what? Much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. So God wants us to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, always bearing fruit. And look at Jeremiah 17, 10. It goes on to say, I, the Lord, I'm the one who searches the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Okay? So God looks at what you're producing. If you're not producing fruit, the New Testament says, well, I guess if, it depends. If, if, if you're not a fruit-bearing tree, well, then you're not producing fruit. is isn't any big deal. But God says he created us to be tree-producing fruit. And if you're a tree-producing fruit, or you're supposed to be, and you're not producing fruit, what, what good is it? Well, let's look. Let me ask you something. How do we become like a tree planted by the living waters bearing much fruit? How do we do that? How do we, I mean, it even says in the Gospels, the, I see men like trees walking. All through the Bible, men are compared to being trees or humans are. So how, we all think all of us want to become like a tree planted by the living waters. We all want to bear fruit, right? Well, do you know Psalms 1 tells us how to do that? It says right here, here's how you do it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the paths of sinners. He does not see, sit in the seat of the scornful. Okay, those are the, the bad things. But what's the good things? He delights in what? The law. Wow, you want to be a tree planted by the living waters, bearing much fruit, like it says in John 15? Well, then you need to delight in the law of the Lord. And in his law, or his Torah, if you meditate day and night, you shall be what? Like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You want to be a tree? I mean, when I think of John 15, and I read he wants us to be like a tree, bearing much fruit, what do I need to meditate in? And how often? Day and night. And then look at what it says. It says that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall what? Now in all the prosperity doctrine in the church, how many of you hear that it, it means by meditating on the law day and night? I mean, that's the true prosperity doctrine right there. It's plain as day. Now, now think about this. It just got done saying that the man is blessed who doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord and he shall prosper, right? Jeremiah is very familiar with that. And so look how he responds in 12, verse one through three. He says, righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet, can I talk to you a little bit about your judgments here? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? How many of us sometimes wonder that? God, how come, what's the deal? You just got done saying the righteous are going to prosper. Well, how, and I can imagine Jeremiah, he's saying, well, hey, I can you imagine? He has the gall to say to God, let me question you a little bit about your judgments here, God. How come the wicked get to prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You planted them. Yes, they've taken root. They grow, yes, and they're bearing fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. 
And then he says, but you, oh Lord, you know me, you've seen me, and you've tested my heart toward you. See, God says, I'm the one that tests the heart, I test the mind. And can you feel Jeremiah's turmoil here? This is why I like interweaving these scriptures together, because it really gives us an idea of where Jeremiah is coming from. So we go to Jeremiah 15, 15 through 19. Realize these are all written at the same time. And I'm even going to interweave 12 and 15 and 17 together because it really helps paint a better picture of what's going on. And so what does Jeremiah say now? He says, oh Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. And your enduring patience don't take me away. And then he says, no, for your sake, God, that I've suffered rebuke. And then he says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And then he says, I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers. See, he's going right back to Psalms 1. He's saying, look, I didn't do those things, nor did I rejoice. He says, I sat alone because of your hand, for you filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? And remember, he says, you'll be like uh, streams by the living water. And so what does he say here? He says, will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream, O God, as waters that fail? Therefore, this is what the Lord says to him. If you return, I'll bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. But he says, let them return to you, but you must not return to them. In other words, these wicked people, they need to come to you. I don't want you going to them. You following that? And then what do we find as we go back to Jeremiah 12, verse 5 through 11? Here Jeremiah is doing a little whining. Okay. And here's what God says to him. He says, look, Jeremiah, if you have run with the footmen and they've wearied you, how are you going to contend with the horses when they come? If in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Now look at this. This is just incredible. And here God gives Jeremiah the great news. Even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they've called a multitude after you. Don't believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. And then God says this, look, Jeremiah, I've forsaken my house. I've left my heritage. I've given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It's crying out against me. In other words, a, a lion is trying to attack something, a prey, here the people of God were roaring at God in indignation. Now this is a year after the reforms are beginning. See, this is what I want you to realize. This is what's happening right after the, Josiah's reforms are just beginning. He says, my heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Many rules, rulers, this is incredible. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. It wasn't the common people that destroyed his vineyard. It was the priests, the princes, the rulers. He says, they've trodden my portion underfoot. They made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They've made it desolate, desolate. It mourns to me. Here the land is crying out to God. The whole land is made desolate. And why is that? Because no one takes it to heart. I mean, this is just incredible. So what does God say concerning Israel? He says, Israel, you've forsaken me, says the Lord. You've gone backward. Therefore, I'm going to stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I'm weary of relenting. I will winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I'll destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Now, again, this is a year after Josiah is beginning reforms. And then concerning Jeremiah, what does God say to him? In Jeremiah 15, 20 and 21, he says, Jeremiah, I'm going to make you to this people a fortified brazen wall. And they're going to fight against you, but they're not going to prevail against you. I'm with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the wicked. I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. You know, I mean, that's great, God, that you're going to be with me, but boy, this is not going to be fun. So I'm going to go back again to Jeremiah 2.13, where God says, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns that hold no water. Because I can't help but think in the Gospels of John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. 
here it was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus stood out and he cried, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We can't help but go back to that verse. And what do we see in Isaiah 12 during the Feast of Tabernacles? They would sing this song. Isaiah 12, two through six, that's the entire chapter is six verses long. Uh, well, one through six. But you're going to find that this is a song that would be sung every year on the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the song that Jesus interrupted when he stood up and shouted that verse we just read in John 7. And here it says, Behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. So right when they were singing, with joy you draw water from the wells of Yeshua, that's when Yeshua jumped up and he shouted out, yes, as the scripture says that you were just singing. This is what is, this is about me. And this is what's crazy. It goes on to say, look at this. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declaring his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord. He's done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Now look at this. And Jesus cries out and shouts this, what he just says, come unto me. And look what it says. Cry out and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. This is what they're singing as they're singing him, the Holy One of Israel, crying out in their midst. I mean, this is just astounding. And then what do we find in John 7, 40 and 42? It says, many people from the crowd, when they heard this, they said, truly, this is the prophet spoken of by Moses. And others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, is the Messiah supposed to come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that he comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there's big debate on whether he's the Messiah or not as he cried this out. And so in verse 45 through 49, we see the officers, they're coming to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they're all upset at the officers and says, why haven't you brought him to us? And this officer said, well, no one ever spoke like this man. And so then the Pharisees, the Pharisees answered them and they said, are you deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? This crowd does not know the law. Therefore, they're cursed. Okay. So the, the priests, the prophets, the scribes, the ones who are supposed to know the law, are telling the people who don't know the law but know the Messiah that they're cursed because they don't know the law. I mean, this is crazy. And then what's amazing is what comes at, what's the very next day? If you remember, this was the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. What happens on the next day? What is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles called? Okay, you've got Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah. Okay, it's the last day, it's the eighth day of great assembly and everyone's supposed to be rejoicing in the Torah, right? Our delight. Well, what happens? These great legal scholars, they're rejoicing in the Torah by bringing in this woman they wanna kill on Simchat Torah. Talk about totally misunderstanding everything. This is supposed to be the day you rejoice in the Torah and they're trying to use the Torah to kill somebody. Now, I thought this was incredible. I want to bring this in. I know Art taught on Zephaniah last week, but I want to bring this in in light of what we're reading in Jeremiah because they were in the same time frame. Look at this. It says, woe to her who is rebellious and polluted. Well, that sounds just like the scribes and the Pharisees, didn't it? It says to the oppressing city, she's not obeyed his voice. She's not received correction. She's not trusted in the Lord. She's not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Remember, we just got done reading in Jeremiah how God says that the people are like roaring lions are roaring against me, God says. She's not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. That leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They've done violence to the Torah. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. Now think of this in terms of 
Zephaniah speaking. Now let's go to Yeshua's time. And it just got done saying every morning the Lord brings justice to light. And what happens? They come to him in the morning with this woman they say caught in adultery. And he's about to bring justice to light in the morning. John 8, 2 and 9. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. And here comes those scribes and Pharisees we were just reading about in Zephaniah. And it says, they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they set, had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. And then it says, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you have to say? Let, let's hear the word of the Lord, okay? And it says, this they said, testing him that they might have something in which to accuse him. But instead, what does Jesus do? As you all know, he writes, he stoops down. He writes on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear and when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them. Now, remember, as he raises himself up, they're able to read what he's written on the ground. He says, okay, who's without sin among you? Let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped and down and he began to write on the ground. And it says, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman was standing in the midst. Now, there's a lot of historical things that are going on here. In case you didn't know, let me just bring it out real quick. You know how we have city courts, county courts, state courts, federal courts, you know. Well, back then, they kind of had the same thing. You know, they had the little bait dens that were in the communities. They had a little Sanhedrin that would handle other matters, you know, in Jerusalem. And then they had the great Sanhedrin, okay. Only the great Sanhedrin could implement a death penalty. The city courts, the little bait dens, could not institute the death penalty. The little Sanhedrin could not implement the death penalty. Only the great Sanhedrin could do that. Well, they say historically during the time of Yeshua, the great Sanhedrin, because they saw that it was so corrupt, the priesthood, the politicians and everything else, they left what was called the chamber of the hewn stone in the Temple Mount area and went to another area. Because they moved out of the chamber of the hewn stone, capital cases could not be tried anymore. This is why when they brought Jesus to the Jews, they said, according to our law, we can't kill him. You need to hang him because they had left the chamber of the hewn stone. So what that is telling you when they say in his case, legally, they couldn't do it. And then you see they're stone, trying to stone Stephen, stoning Paul, trying to kill this adulterous woman. That is telling you that it was mob rule. This wasn't the great Sanhedrin. This is like after Hurricane Katrina and it's just mob ruling and running everywhere. That's what it was like during Yeshua's time when he was uh, hung on the tree and turned over. This wasn't a legal Jewish court doing this. This was mob rule. Uh, There's so many laws that were broken. Uh, it's uh, incredible. But I don't have time to go into all of that. But here's the point that I want to make. Look at Jeremiah 17 again in light of John 8, verse 13 through 15. The day before, we just got done reading in John 7, how the scribes, the Pharisees says, oh, these people that don't know the law are cursed, okay? They had just forsaken the fountain of living waters. And so the very next day, what happens, okay? Well, look at Jeremiah 17, 13 through 15. It says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be what? I can just see Yeshua beginning to write their names in the earth what he's drawing in the ground. And they're familiar with this. They know they've just forsaken the fountain of living waters. He's probably writing, in, he's probably writing Jeremiah 17, that verse in the dirt and writing their names. Or maybe he wrote this first and they all of a sudden started to leave when he began to write names. He says, because they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And then I can't help but think of the adulterous woman caught in the act say, heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Save me and I'll be saved for you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Well, remember in Hebrew, there's no it. And so in other words, they could be saying, translating this as where is the word of the Lord? Let him come now. This is in Jeremiah. Well, guess what? The word of the Lord was there and he was coming. Okay. And so uh, when you think about it, they were in big trouble. Now, how many of you know Israel had been playing the harlot during Jeremiah's time when this was written? And what do they do? They bring a supposedly harlot, adulterous woman before Yeshua to have him stoned. 
And Yeshua was thinking, look, Israel, you played the harlot. If you want to play by this rule, I can destroy you right now. Think about it. As a matter of fact, here's the thing. Remember, they just got done saying that she was caught in the very act. And so God was saying, okay, you want to follow Torah? Let me tell you how it works. Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 20. It says it cautions a court. If a false witness rise up against anyone to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. Well, guess what? They're all standing before the Lord, the adulterous woman and these guys before the priests and the judges, which would be in those days. And then it says, and the judge shall make diligent inquisition. Okay, well, the Lord himself was the judge. And he says, you want to play that game? Okay, I'll, let me tell you what. We're going we're to do a diligent inquisition and, and we're going to see what happens here. And then it says, behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against their brother, then what's going to be done to him is he had thought to have done to his brother. In other words, the Lord's saying, you want to play this game, guys? Okay, line up. We're going to stone you. If, you're, if there's any false witnesses, because that's what you want to do to this woman. And uh, it says, then those who remain will hear and fear and henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. Well, I think that is just uh, completely incredible because in Deuteronomy, it says if, if adultery takes place, you have to bring both the man and the woman. Well, they just got done saying they were caught in the very act and yet they only brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. Oh, hey, so, I mean, there was so much obfuscation and whatever you want to call it, them I mean, lying and everything else that they, were, they knew they were in trouble. So that's why they left. But what does the Lord say in Zephaniah 3, 8, 9? To like the, the woman who was supposedly almost stoned. He says, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up for plunder. <clears throat> this is the good news. God says, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, all the earth will be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the people a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now, I'm sure Art read that last week. And one of the amazing things about this, how many of you remember at the Tower of Babel when beyond anyone's control, God just went blink in everybody's 70 different languages. And that was just what it was. Well, what I see this as being is God is going to do a reversal of the Tower of Babylon and everyone will again speak Hebrew. Who wants to wait for the free download? Okay. The free download is coming, but I think that still, I want to, I want to learn it earlier. And one of the things, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if Art mentioned this, but do you know that this particular verses here is like the only verse in the entire Bible where every Hebrew letter is used in this verse, including the final forms? You know, again, so I think that's kind of fascinating in the light of what the, the verse says. And then what do we see again in Zephaniah 3, 12 through 15? What does God say he's going to do to Israel? He says, I'm going to leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they'll trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no unrighteousness. They'll speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down. No one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He's cast out your enemy. And look at this here again. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you're going to see disaster no more. So this time is coming. It goes on to say in verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He'll rejoice over you with gladness. He'll quiet you with his love. He'll rejoice over you with singing. Boy, they can hardly wait till that takes place. And then it goes on to say in verse 20, at that time, I'm going to bring you back. Even at the time I'll gather you, if I will give you fame and praise among all the people of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Well, now let's, with this in mind, let's go back now and look at Jeremiah 12, 14 through 17. Now look, he just got done saying that he's going to really judge all the nations, didn't he? God's purpose is to bring all the nations to Israel and he's going to judge them there. But look what happens. In verse 14 through 17, it says, thus says the Lord, against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance, which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. And what is he talking about? The land, that's their inheritance. 
So he's saying all of his evil neighbors, the ones that surround the nation of Israel, who touch the land that I want my people Israel to inherit. Behold, he says, I'm going to pluck them out of their land. I'm going to pluck out of the house of Judah from among them. And then it will be after I pluck them out that I'm going to return and have compassion on them and bring them back. Everyone to his heritage, everyone to his land. And it will be, now look at this, what God says to the nations, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people. Who are the nations supposed to learn the ways of? Israel, to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught, as these other nations have taught God's people to swear by Baal, then they're going to be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Wow. So what do we see? It's all about repentance. It's all about returning to the Lord. And what do we find in Jeremiah's day? In a few short years, they're going to find the Torah scroll and revival will come. All right, so let's go back to Jeremiah 2, verse 32. And what does God say? He says, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? And yet here's the whole problem. He says, my people have forgotten me dates without number. Now, how many of you mind if someone who you have no clue of in another nation forgets you? As far as you knew, they never even knew you to begin with. So who cares if they forgot you? And you sure don't know them. But the problem here is God is not upset at all the heathen that don't know him. God is not upset and all the heathen that have probably forgotten him. God is upset at his people who have forgotten him. Okay? For days without number. In other words, he's talking to believers. People who are supposed to trust in him, but they, they're users. They're God stalkers. They only pull God out of their pocket when they want him. Otherwise, we'll set you on the counter, God. God is not every day in their thoughts. He's only in their thoughts when they're in trouble. Okay, God wants, just like with any relationship, do you want someone who only talks to you when they want something? I mean, come on. Well, it's the same thing. God says, they for totally forgot me days without number. The only reason they're going to even think about me is if, if they need something or want something. What kind of relationship is that? Yeah, Jeremiah 2.35. Here's what's incredible. Well, look what God says. It says, yet you guys are saying, well, it's because I'm innocent. Surely his anger is going to turn from me. God says, behold, I will plead my case against you because you say I have not, I have not sinned. This is the problem. People are self-deceived. The thing about self-deception is it's just that. It's self-deception. We think we're innocent. We haven't sinned. And yet God says, oh, yeah. Now, look at this. This is quite incredible. This is Jeremiah chapter 17, where we're at, verse 20 through 23. It says, and say unto them, he's telling Jeremiah to say this. He says, say, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Now, I want you to notice the word for burden there is masa. It's the mem shin aleph. Does everyone see that? Okay, well, that's going to come important. They're not supposed to bear a burden on the Sabbath day, Right nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do any work but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. And what does it say? They obeyed not. They didn't incline their ear. They made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. Now we plainly saw that they were not to bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it out of their house, right? Well, guess what? Look what this next verse says. Psalms 38, 4 says, my iniquities have gone over my head as a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. One of the biggest burdens we have is our iniquities. Now, sometimes people will judge someone, oh, you're carrying a burden on the working on the Sabbath. And yet how many of us carry the burden of our sins out of our house and bring it into the church and infect everybody else with it? We got to call a spade a spade or whatever you want to call it. If we're not to bear burdens on the Sabbath, that is more than just not carrying a load. That means don't, you need to resolve. It's like a, a weekly thing, getting before God and saying, God, that's why he says, cast your burdens upon me. What is he talking about? Our sins, our iniquities. We need to carry them before the Lord. And we need to do it on a weekly basis, not just on Yom Kippur or not just on the Feast of Trumpets. 
We need to lighten our load every week. We're not supposed to be carrying our burdens of our sins upon our shoulders. How many of you know if you put something, too heavy a load on something it wasn't made for, it's gonna break it? And the humans wonder why we're always so broken. You're carrying things you're not supposed to carry. We need to get rid of these things every week. We shouldn't, if, you know, it says don't let uh, the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the wheat go down on your burden. You need, to, you need to get these things off. Jeremiah 17, 27, it says, but if you will not hearken me to hallow the Sabbath and not to bear a burden, even erring at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath, then I'm gonna kindle a fire in the gates. It'll devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it will not be quenched. Let's jump to Jeremiah 23, which is written at the same time frame. See, this is why I like to compare 17 and 23 and all these chapters together because then it makes more sense. It says here in verse 34 through 36, now, here's what's amazing when you think of a burden. How many of you, if you have a burden in your mind, you figure something heavy, something that, you know, hurts your back or something that you're carrying around? Well, guess what they thought of the Torah? It says, as for the prophet and the priest and the people, they'll say, oh, the burden of the Lord. In other words, they saw the law of the Lord as a heavy burden. God says, I'm even going to punish that man in his house. Thus shall you say everyone to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, what has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more for every man's word will be his burden. For you have perverted the words of the living God of the Lord of hosts, our God. In other words, here they don't consider their sins a burden. It's what they love and they call the law a burden. This is what God is talking about here. What do you mean the burden of the Lord? You're acting like the law is a burden. Well, that happens today. How many of you today hear people saying that, oh, that's just a big burden that's been taken away. Now I get to keep all my sins, my burdens. I mean, you can just see it's just the opposite. It doesn't even make any sense. Now that word masan in your Strong's 4053, it says it can also mean an utterance, chiefly of doom. Okay, in other words, here comes uh, the burden of the Lord could be this prophetic utterance of doom that's coming. You following me? And it's like, oh, great. What are we going to do with this? So I wanted you to see that that word Massah can also be something that's spoken. It goes back again to the Sabbath, not bearing a burden on the Sabbath. Why are we saying things that we shouldn't be saying that, you know, we're bringing with us? Look at 1 John 5, 3. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are what? They're not burdensome. And this is what God is so upset about is people that call his commandments burdensome. We see here in the New Testament, they're not. Now, here's what's something else that I just wanted to bring in that I thought was incredible. Now, how many of you know uh, the Tanakh? The T is for the Torah. What is the N for? The Nevi'im, the prophets. Okay, so typically the word for prophet, for prophecy, for prophesy, is that word, the root word. And you'll see that here. In 2 Chronicles 15, 8, it says, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, and you see the noon bait aleph in both of those. Okay, that's the word for prophecy and the word for prophet, your, your navi, all right? And it, it comes uh, from 5030, you'll notice, uh, which comes from 5012, which is a prophet. You see the word navi, uh, 5012 is the word, uh, the word to prophesy. And again, you have the noon bait aleph, okay? Or the NVA or NVI, however you want to look at it, the navi. Does everyone see that is basically the root word for prophet, prophesy, prophecy, okay? Now, the reason why I brought that up is let's look at that word uh, masa again. There's something I wanted to add. Not only is it an utterance chiefly of doom, but it also could be singing or a prophecy. So here, the word prophecy may not be nevi, noon, bait, all left. It could be masa. Does everyone see that? Which also means a burden, which goes back to a burden of a word of prophecy. Now look at this. Here's another word I want to introduce. In Leviticus 26, 18, it says, and if you will not yet for all this hearken to me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And that word for punish there, yesar, 
Look at what it is. 3256 in the Strong's. It means to chastise literally with blows or figuratively with words. So in other words, if, if, someone's, if you ever felt like someone just whipped you with their words, that's just sorrow. It's like you've been just disciplined by words, okay? Now, and now wait, before you look at your notes, none of you cheating here, don't look ahead. <clears throat> You know what's amazing? How many of you heard of the Proverbs 31 woman? Yes. Right? But most people don't even know who it's to, what it's about, or how it begins. Let's look at Proverbs 31.1. It says, the words of King Lemuel. Now, King Lemuel is another name for Solomon. Okay? That was what his uh, mother called him. Okay? And it says, the prophecy that his mother what? Do you know the word for prophecy there is burdened? And the word for taught there is to whip up on him and punish him with words. In other words, Solomon, who had all these wives and all these concubines, his mom is prophesying doom to him and whipping him with words if he doesn't shape up and look for a virtuous woman and quit treating, quit tra not quit treating woman like he does. The Proverbs 31 woman was spoken by Solomon's mother who was chastising him for the way he's treating women and he needs to find one virtuous woman and stick with her. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Most people don't know the context, but that's the context. It's his mom whipping up on him, beating him with her words because of his bad behavior. Incredible. Okay, well, let's go back again to 2 Chronicles 34.1. I want to go back again and look at it from another perspective. We see Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. So he began his reign as a second grader. Now, do you think there's another power behind the throne here? Probably. Who do you think are the people that are really in charge? He's in like the Queen of England. It's a figurine position at this age. Who do you think is really ruling the place? The priests and the kings, the rulers, the priests and the princes are the ones in charge here. Okay. Now look at 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3, the first part. It says, now in the eighth year of his reign, so now he's 16 years old, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. Okay. We realize he's now the age of a sophomore in high school. He already has a one-year-old. His wife is pregnant with another one. Okay, and he begins to seek after God. I would too. <laughs> and what do we find? In the second half of 2 Chronicles 34, 3, it says, and then in the 12th year, so it fast forwards four more years. Okay, he's now 20 years old. It says, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Okay, so he's 20 years old. Reformations are beginning. So what do we find? First, he began to seek God which comes first, and then reformation follows. Okay, so we seek God, reformation follows, but even a year after reformation, here comes Jeremiah with all of his tough words. Okay, now if you're King Josiah, you're hearing these different prophets, you know, and you might wonder, well, is this true? There's false prophets and true prophets, okay? Well, let's go to verse five through seven. What does Josiah do? He's heard Jeremiah's prophecies, and he says, I better get to work. And so he burns the bones of the priests on their altars and he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And this is what he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even to Naphtali with their tools round about. And look at this. He broke down the altars, the Asherahs, and he had beaten the carved images into powder. He cut down all the idols in all the land of Israel and he returns to Jerusalem. So he's thinking, man, what Jeremiah is saying, this, if this is true, we better get to work. And so he, he goes throughout the land and he tears everything down and he returns to Jerusalem. But guess what else he does, does in all these cities while he's tearing everything down? He's saying, show me the money. He says, we need to repair the temple. Not only are we going to do the, the right thing and tear everything down that you built, I'm going to collect money from all of you to build the true and repair what's going on. So what do we find in verse, chapter 34, uh, verse 8 of 2 Chronicles? In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house. Now, wait a minute. When it says he purged the land and the house, what house did he purge? The temple. So he sent Saphan, the son of Azaliah, 
and Masai, the governor of the city, and Joha, the son of Jehoahaz, the recorder, to do what? To repair the house of the Lord his God. Well, that takes money to repair the house of the Lord. And so what do we see in verse 9 through 11? When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel and all of Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. So here's what he's doing. He's going to all those places, destroying everything. He's collecting bags of silver from all these people. He takes them and he gives it to the Levites in charge of the temple. And so it says, and now they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. They gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house, even to the artificers and builders. They gave it to buy hewn stone, timber for couplings, and to floor the houses, which who, destis, who destroyed these? The kings of Judah had destroyed the floor of within the temple. It wasn't the enemy who did it. This is the kings of Judah. Now think about this. Look, think about how many years this house has been destroyed. I mean, it's, you have, uh, Hezekiah was basically the last righteous one, but then you had Manasseh, his son, for like 50 years, where he's the one that really destroyed it. But then you have his son, Ammon, okay? And so, can you, but now think about this. The priests, the princes, who were really in charge from the time he was a second grader, for 20 years hadn't even bothered to repair the house of the Lord. Think about that. He, he was in, he's supposed to be a good king, but he's in, you know, second grade. It's not until he t he's like 26 years old that they decide to pre repair the house of the Lord. That tells you these priests and princes really didn't care. What kind of a priest are you working in that kind of environment? That the other kings of Israel had, or kings of Judah had totally destroyed the temple themselves. It wasn't the enemy that destroyed it. It was their own kings, princes, and the priests didn't even care. Who was in charge the last 12 years? So what do we see in verse 14 and 15? When they brought out the silver that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord by Moses. You know what happened, what I see happening when I read this? More than likely, the law of the Lord wasn't even in the temple. Someone probably that loved the Lord took the Torah scrolls out while it was in total desecration and put it in one of the bags of silver now that they saw it was being repaired and as they're dumping out all the bags of silver, out comes the scroll of Deuteronomy and they found it in the house of the Lord. It never was there for the last 20 years. It was a righteous person who had kept that Torah scroll that probably put it in one of their money bags. When it got dumped out, they find it and they go, looky here. And so Helkiah answered and said to Saphon the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Go figure. Wow, it's actually there. So he delivers the book to Saphon, you know. And in verse 17, it says, They poured out the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and delivered it into the hand of the overseers. This is telling you that Torah scroll was found as they were pouring out the silver. And let's look at verse 18 and 19. So Saphon the scribe tells the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it happened when the king heard the words of the law, what did he do? All of a sudden, everything he's been hearing, saying verbally, he now has an actual book that's being read to him and he knows this is true. This isn't just a hearing of the ear, now it's the seeing of the eye. I hear the book, I see the book, they're reading from the book. Boy, are we in trouble. Now, What's happening? Babylon has been in power now for several years, and he really knows this. I may be that generation. Okay. Well, what do we, what do we, look at the pattern here. I want you to think about this for a minute. Look at this pattern. Seeking God brings what? Reformation. Reformation leads us to Torah. The Torah was found after the Reformation began. The Reformation did not begin until he began to seek God. So there's a difference between leaders that are evil and leaders that are good. The good leader is seeking God. Reformation is beginning. They find the law and now comes revival. Second Chronicles 34, 20, 21. So what does the king do? He commanded Hilkiah and Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asa, the servant to the king, saying, what does he tell them to do? I want you to go and inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. 
For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. I want a group of you, go, go talk to the Lord. And I wrote this book and you come back and tell me just exactly what's happening. So what does that tell us? Torah will always bring clarity to our situation. Yes, the king, he had sought the Lord. Yes, there had been some reformation, but guess what? Great wrath was still on the horizon. Sometimes we can seek God and reform our ways, but that doesn't mean the punishment still isn't coming. What do we find in verse 22 of 2 Chronicles 34? Hilkiah and those of the king, who did they go to? They went to hold of the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvat. Remember, that's the word for hope the son of Hosea, the keeper of the robes, and she lived in Jerusalem in the college, and they spoke to her about this. They had a Bible college back then, guys. And they, they go to her to, okay, let's take a look at this. All of us, you know, have a group Bible study here. What's God trying to tell us? What's going to happen? Let's inquire of the Lord. And so look what she, how she answers them. She says, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man that sent you to me, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah. Wow. Now think about this. If I'm Josiah, I say, look, for the last, you know, 20 years, I've been seeking God. I've been seeking reformation. We found the Torah. I'm trying to do everything right and go inquire the Lord. And the Lord says, bad news is coming. He says, because they've forsaken me, they burned incense to other gods. Remember, he had gone through and tore down all the, the altars of incense that they had in the groves and everything. But God's saying, look, they burned. It. You know what this is telling you? This is, this is later. This is like a year or so later. This is telling you that even after Josiah went and tore down everything, they rebuilt them. Joseph, remember, it's one thing for a righteous king to go about and do it. But if the people aren't righteous, they're going to go right back to their evil ways again. So God is saying, you go tell Josiah, yeah, he's righteous, but guess what? These people, they've already gone back to burning incense to other gods. That they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out upon this place and not be quenched. And then she says this, as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so you shall say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Oh my you know, I can just see Josiah wanting to know what, you know, what's going on here. I thought I had cleansed everything. Had the people been insincere? Here they have their secret sins and altars. Well, look what she says to concerning Josiah. You go tell King Josiah, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before your God when you heard his words against this place and against its people and humbled yourself before me and tore your garments and wept before me, I have even heard also, says the Lord, behold, I'm going to gather you to your fathers and you'll be gathered to your grave in peace, nor shall your eyes see all the evil which I'll bring on this place and upon its people. And they brought the king word again. Now, if you were just, like I said, remember what it was Hezekiah's words. Hallelujah, not in my time. And now it's his great grandson. And the same words are spoken to him from the word of the Lord. Guess what? It's not going to happen in your time. Well, you know what would be pretty scary to me when I think about this? Now, how old is he at this time? He's only 26 years old. He heard God say judgment is happening in this generation, but you're not going to see it. I guess I'm dying early. You follow me? Hey, by he's saying, okay, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, there's two ways of looking at this. Well, guess what? He dies 13 years later. Look at 2 Chronicles 34, 30 through 33. Now we saw his great grandpa's response, Hezekiah was great, it's not happening in my time, wahoo. But what's his response? Does he just look out for himself? See, this is the amazing thing. Even though the king was righteous, the people weren't. So what does the king do? He doesn't do what his great grandpa Hezekiah did. What does he do? It says the king went up into the house of the Lord in verse 30 through 33. And all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and the people, great and small, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul. What does this remind you of? The Shema, 
okay, to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And he calls, caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And what does Josiah do? He again has to go and take away all the abominations out of all the areas, countries that pertain to the children of Israel. So here had already done it once. They built them all back. He's got to go back and take them all down again. And it says, and he made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God in all his days that he parted not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Now, how many of you know people can follow the Lord or do what he asks, but not with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? They do it out of fear, of punishment, okay? So yes, it says they, they did what the Lord wanted, but the question is, were they doing it because they were hoping that the next generation would be the one to get the punishment, or were they doing it because they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? So this brings us to Jeremiah chapter 11, all right? And listen, now see, this is why I like to bring Jeremiah 11 in with these other things, because you can connect the dots. Look what God says in verse one through three, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, here are the words of what? Okay, so Jeremiah 11 is tied over here to Second Chronicles where he's reading the words of the covenant. So now you can tie it together and, and get the time frame of what's going on. And he says, speak to the men of Judah and to the people of Jerusalem and say to them, so says the Lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. And then look at 2 Chronicles 35, 1. This is, this is what happens after Jeremiah says this. All of a sudden, Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. But I'm gonna show you this king's heart. King Josiah was incredible. Look at what it says. And Josiah gave to the people of the flock of the lambs and the kids all for the Passover offerings for all that were present to the number of 33,000 bulls that were of the king's substance. He supplied the Passover offerings for the entire nation. And if you read the rest of it, it goes on and on and on how even the kings and the princes and the priests also gave willingly. They're all trying to do what they could. And look what it says in verse 18 and 19. And there was no Passover like that kept in Israel. Now look at the time frame. From the days of Samuel the prophet. Yea, none of the kings of Israel, which includes Solomon, which includes David, kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel who were found and the people of Jerusalem, the Passover was kept in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah. So this was a Passover like none ever. Solomon never even came close to keeping a Passover like Josiah did. When you read all of 2 Chronicles 35, you'll see why. But now, here, they just got done keeping the greatest Passover ever. And what does God tell Jeremiah to tell the people? Let's go back to chapter 11, verse 3 through 5. He says, say to them, so says the Lord God of Israel, curse is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought him out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, obey my voice and do them according to all that I command you. So you shall be my people. I'll be your God so that I may fulfill the oath, which I've sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then I answered and said, amen, O Lord. Amen. You know what I see when I read this? I think this isn't on your notes, but I think of Deuteronomy 30. I set before you this day life and death, blessing and a curse. God is all forgiving. And he's saying, look, guys, here's your opportunity. Do you want life or death, blessing or curse? And that's what he presents before every single one of us every day when we have to decide do we want to sin or not. Okay. Why do we choose? I mean, if, if I set before you, a, a good energy drink or something that's healthy and some poison, I don't think any one of you would pick the poison. If I, especially if I labeled it poison over here. Okay, <laughs> healthy stuff here. And yet, how often when it comes to us making decisions, if we're going to fall into temptation or sin or not, do we pick the poison? You wanna know why? is because we're not immediately stricken by something when we do. It's because the sentence is put off. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. Because the sentence is put off, men's heart are fully set in them to do evil. If God had it set up to every time someone stole something, they immediately died, 
How many of you know stealing would stop real quick? They would go, ooh, that one's important. I'm serious. It's because the sentence is put off, we, tend to, we keep tending to go into the ditch over and over and over again. But the, God is trying to show them mercy here. And so but what does it say in verse 6 to 8? It goes on to say, then the Lord says to me, Declare all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly testified to your fathers in the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even to this day, rising early and testifying, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey nor bowed down their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. So I will bring on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not do them. And then what do we find in verse 9 through 12? Now the Lord speaks to Jeremiah again. Well, I'm sure this is really encouraging to Jeremiah. He says, there's a plot found among the men of Judah and among the people of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. This is even after the greatest Passover has ever been held. They refused to hear my words. They went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So the Lord says this, behold, I'm going to bring evil on them which they shall not be able to escape. And though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then shall the cities of Judah and the people of Jerusalem go and cry to the gods to whom they offer incense, but they will not save them at all in their time of trouble. Matter of fact, he goes on to say in verse 13 and 14, for according to the number of your cities where your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars and that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. And you do not pray for this people can you imagine? He's telling Jeremiah, don't pray for this people. Don't lift up a cry or even a prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time they cry to me for their trouble. Man, that is scary. If you're, if you're so bad, I mean, sometimes we see people, man, I need to pray for that person. How would you like to really want to pray for someone? And God says, no. That person is really in trouble when God says, don't pray for them. And now, this is incredible. In Jeremiah 11, verse 15, look at what this says. God says, what right has my beloved or my people, what right do they have in my house, which he has done these vile deeds? And he says, can vows and sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then rejoice? Or another way of saying this is, do you then think you're safe? They're thinking, well, just so long as we kill an animal, we're good with God. All, that's all God really wants. He just wants us to go kill an animal. He just wants lambs and bulls slaughtered, and then we're going to be good. But see, this is, uh, this is what's been happening all along. Even in the church today, people forget God days without number. Six days a week, they want nothing to do with them. And then it's like, oh, great, I got to go to church. Man, I got 45 minutes all right, let's go. Let's do our 45 minutes. I kept the Sabbath because I went to church for 45 minutes. Now let's go spend the rest of the day doing what I want. How is keeping the Sabbath has resulted in a 45 minute church service? That's what keeping the Sabbath means. You know, and you don't need God. Uh, I just, I just, you know, as long as God's happy, if I just show up and say, Hey God, here I am. See, I care about you. See you later now. And the next, the rest of the week you're on your own. This is what God's saying. When you forget me dates without number, I'm not in all your thoughts. I'm, a, I'm your sugar daddy who just meets your needs that you come to when you have a need. Uh, I mean, how, what kind of a relationship was that? I mean, he, he even calls them his beloved. He wants to spend time with them. But, oh, I don't have time for you, God. I got too many of my own selfish interest things I've got to do with. Hey, I've said the magic words, I'm in. That's the relationship people have. Verse 16 and 17, the Lord once called you a green olive tree, fair with goodly fruit, but with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it. Its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced evil against you because of the evil which the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by burning incense to Baal. And then verse 18 and 19, all of a sudden Jeremiah realizes it. He says, the Lord made it known to me and I knew. Then you did show me their evil deeds, but I was like... A gentle lamb led to the slaughter. Jeremiah says, I did not know it was against me they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. Wow. What a tough crowd he's with. And then look at Jeremiah 11, 20 through 23. God reminds him. 
And or look what Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah says to the Lord. You, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tries the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you have I committed my cause. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth. Now remember, the men of Anathoth, Jeremiah grew up in the city of Anathoth. The city of Anathoth is not, these are the sons of Aaron, not just Levites, but the priests, the sons of Aaron live in Anathoth. And it says here, therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth who seek your life and say, don't prophesy in the name of the Lord or you're gonna die by our hand. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm gonna punish them. The young men will die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters will die by famine. None of them will be left for I'll bring evil upon the men of Anathoth the year of their punishment. These are the priests. These are the ones who were in charge. These are his relatives, mind you. Now next week, guess what happens? Next week, when we look at the Jeremiah, as we come back, everything comes crashing down for Assyria. We're going to look at the last two years of Josiah's reign from Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, chapter 4. Let me put up this PowerPoint. First off, I want you to notice that the first PowerPoint was to 622 B.C., Okay, now all of a sudden, look what happens from 621 to 613. Jeremiah is not prophesying. None of the prophets are being heard. It's this quiet zone of about 10 years. The only thing that happens is Mattaniah is born, whose name becomes Zedekiah, you know, who reigns for the last 11 years. But you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the calm before the storm before the temple is destroyed and everything changes because all of a sudden, everything changes. And it's just like uh, 2001, okay, 9-11 happened. All of a sudden you see this big surge, everyone in the church trying to find out what's going on or a big earthquake. And then what happens over time? Same old, same old. Well, this is what was happening in Jeremiah's time and in Josiah's time. Big reformation, big charge, raw, raw, raw. God's gonna wipe us out, let's go to church or go to synagogue. And then all of a sudden there's this qu quietness. But this is like the, the eye of the hurricane or the calm before the storm and everything all of a sudden comes crashing down because all of a sudden, look what happens. This is what we're gonna be looking at next week is just these chapter three and four mostly right here. And then the next few weeks we'll be looking at all of these chapters. But chapter three and four, when Josiah dies, we're gonna be looking at those things you can see on your chart. Now, historically, the northern tribes, they've been punished at this time. They've been scattered. And God, you know what? He has hoped that Judah would have learned a lesson by what has happened to her sister, the northern tribes, and scattered, right? But next week, we're going to see that God's word to Jeremiah concerning whether Judah had learned that lesson. And remember, this is written but a few short years after that great Passover. I'm gonna close with Jeremiah 3, what we'll be looking at partly of next week. Get a load of this, verse six through 10. This is the last two years of Jeremiah's life, or of Josiah's life. It says, the Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up upon every high mountain, under every green tree, and there has played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn to me, but she returned not and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land, committed adultery with stones and with stocks, and yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but with falsehood, says the Lord, feignedly. So here you, you read about this big repentance, this, this big revival or reformation, but what happens? It's, they're only turning to God feignedly. And I think this is what we're seeing a lot in our country. They're not turning to God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength where it becomes a part of their life. God still becomes something out there that we have to go attend to to keep him happy and then we can go do our own thing. So next week, we're gonna look at uh, Jeremiah three and four mostly. We may look at five and six, depending on how much time we have. So uh, if you've been following along and you wanna read those chapters, take a look at those in light of everything that's going on. Pretty incredible, huh? Amen, let's stand.
And remember, we do have the Zikron CDs if you're interested. Father, we just thank you so much that you care about us and you set before us life and death, blessing and cursing. Let us not think that we can go on uh, in our ways uh, and, and all you want is uh, a few hallelujahs and amens and, and a show up at church. God, you want all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might, all of our strength and nothing less. So God, I pray each and every person here would commit their entire life to you and, and not just use you or not be a God stalker and just stalk you for the benefits or because they're afraid of punishment or they want the reward. My prayer is everyone that is here and everyone that is watching and listening throughout the world that they would fall in love with the living God. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.